on February 22, 2015. 22-year-old Asia Brown and her two-year-old son Ashton were reported missing to the Greensboro Police Department. The following day, they had been discovered in the trunk of Asia's car, which had been set on fire in a secluded area owned by the city. Due to the extent of the damage to Asia and Ashton's bodies, a cause of death could not be determined. However, investigators are positive they were murdered. It's been just over nine years since Asia and Ashton Brown were killed, and investigators are still searching for the person responsible. Hey everyone, welcome back to Detective Perspective. My name is Derek Lavasser. I'm a licensed private investigator and former police detective. Each week I'll be covering an unsolved case in story format. I'll then give you my perspective on the investigation and provide contact information for the individuals or organizations connected to the case so that if you have any tips, you can contact them directly and maybe you can help solve a case. So if you're someone who's interested in true crime, specifically unsolved cases, and you would like to hear my opinion on those investigations, please consider subscribing whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whatever platform you use. Okay, so for today's case, Asia and Ashton Brown, as you will see, we do have some evidence of Asia's whereabouts right before she kind of dropped off the radar. There are some questions about Ashton and whether or not he was there with her, but we will get into that. But overall, this case is, just like any other case we cover, very tragic, and it's clearly affected her family. Uh, from what I understand, they've done no media interviews regarding this case, probably because it's too hard for them to talk about. And as far as the investigation itself, it seems like the police department, for the most part, has dotted their I's and crossed their T's. But I wanted to cover this case regardless because... As I mentioned in the opening, we're talking about the death of a mother, but also the death of her son, a young child. And I've been doing this a long time, 20 years, and I just, I don't think any murder is justified. Well, almost any murder, but especially the murder of a child, two-year-old boy. In some cases, you'll have a situation where the child's a little older and maybe they can implicate the offender. But Ashton was only two years old, so what was he really going to share with anyone? So I really sit back as a human being as a, and as a father and ask myself, why? Why would this person or, or, or people do this to this young child? Why not drop him off somewhere? Now, why not give him a shot? So I just, I just really don't get it. No matter how many cases you work, I don't think something like that will ever make sense. I don't think anyone, uh, regardless of your background can find a way to, to rationalize those acts. But yet here we are. And, and this isn't the only case like this, as we all know, unfortunately. So hopefully, after covering it tonight, if you haven't heard of this case before, you will now be aware of it. And if you or anybody you know has information, you can come forward and maybe assist in solving this case. So with that all out of the way, let's dive into the investigation. Asia LaRose Brown was born in December of 1992. Although details of her childhood remain unclear, those who knew Asia described her as kind, sweet, friendly, and helpful. By 2013, Asia was in her early 20s and had settled in Greensboro, North Carolina, where she was raising her newborn baby, Ashton Paul Brown. Friends later told the news and record that Asia's whole life revolved around Ashton. She was an incredible mother who loved spoiling her son with love, affection, and gifts. According to Asia's friends, Ashton was a happy baby who enjoyed eating, playing, making people laugh, and everything Mickey Mouse. In 2013, Asia met a woman named Brittany while working at a fast food restaurant. They bonded instantly, both being single mothers working hard to provide for their children. Over time, Asia and Brittany's friendship grew stronger, and Brittany became Ashton's babysitter. Eventually, Asia and Brittany both took jobs working security at Greensboro Auto Auction. They were on opposite shifts, which was convenient because when Asia showed up to relieve Brittany at work, 
Ashton could then go home with her. By early 2015, Asia and Ashton, who was now two years old, were living in an apartment on Orchard Street in Greensboro. Asia was still working at the auction where she was known for being a reliable employee. So when Asia didn't show up to relieve Brittany at work on February 21st, Brittany was surprised and immediately concerned. She later told the news and record that she knew Asia wouldn't do a no call, no show. She wouldn't jeopardize her job, especially as a single mother. Brittany tried calling Asia, but her phone went straight to voicemail, and she thought that maybe Ashton was sick and Asia's phone was broken. But when Asia didn't show up for work the next day, Brittany became even more concerned. She drove to Asia's apartment, which was deserted. She continued calling Asia, but got no response. That evening, Brittany contacted the police and reported Asia and Ashton missing. I have a friend that, that's missing. I haven't seen, she, she hasn't been at work in two days. She won't answer, like, no one's seen her for two days. I went to buy her apartment, there's no sign of her. She has no, um, in like, um, I guess forms or stuff, stuff in her, stuff in her door that she hasn't been home to check. So it's clear she hasn't been home, you know, and I'm just concerned now. Her phone went straight to voicemail and has been for two days. She will say why she hasn't come to work, which is completely out of character. She's never missed work. Okay, what's the address she was last seen? I um I don't know. I, I, I the last time I spoke to her was Friday afternoon. Okay. And I haven't physically seen her in over a week. So over about a week. I saw her last weekend and I um I thought that was odd, you know, but I said, Well maybe, you know, he got sick or something, whatever and after day all day of calling and no rep no response, she never called our supervisor to tell him why she didn't show up. She wouldn't do that. So I just at this point, you know, here it is two days later and she still hasn't yet to contact anybody. Brittany continued talking about how unusual it was for Asia not to contact anyone for days. Then she gave more detail about the last time she spoke to Asia, which was on the afternoon of February 20th. She said they texted back and forth that afternoon, but after 1.40 p.m., Asia never replied. We were making plans to go out to eat, and I, um, I told her that um, she rather, I'd rather just come over. So she said, that's fine. She said, I'm going to go get some stuff straight with my car because she's been looking for a car. So I assumed she was, you know, you know, you know, browsing around the city, trying, you know, trying to find a deal or something like that, you know, looking at different cars. And I said that um, I had my daughter and that she could bring her son. It was fine. You know, they could play. And I said, so just let me know. And she never responded to that text. I think that text at 140 and she just stopped texting me back. She never responded again. I said so that night. She didn't respond. She didn't show up for work that morning to relieve me. She, and her phone has been off ever since then. Now, before getting off the phone, the dispatcher asked what kind of car Asia drove. Brittany explained that the last she knew, Asia was driving a Mustang, but since she had been looking for a new car, Brittany wasn't sure about what she was currently driving. After this call, the police began looking for Asia, but she was nowhere to be found. Neither was her two-year-old son, Ashton. On February 23rd at around 3.30 p.m., Greensboro City workers conducting maintenance near South Buffalo Creek stumbled upon a burnt 2005 black Buick LaCrosse hidden in the woods off Thurston Avenue, which was a service road. According to WCNC, Thurston Avenue ends with a wooded area owned by the city of Greensboro and is used for both water and sewer purposes. Because it was a remote spot that wasn't easily accessed, the workers decided to investigate the car, and when they looked in the trunk area, they saw bones. They quickly retreated and called their supervisor, who then contacted the police. Gil from Metro 911, what is the address of your emergency? Um, the address is Thurston Avenue. Uh, the cross street is Industrial Avenue. Um, Greensboro, one of my employees just called me and told me he found a burnt car with a dead body inside of it. Okay, what's the uh, cross street again, sir? Uh, the address, you don't have the exact address because it's on the outfall in the woods on Thurston Avenue. Uh-huh. And Thurston runs off of Industrial Avenue. That's the Cross Street Industrial. And I'm going to pull around there right now, and I'll be up at the top of the street waiting for someone to get out there. All righty, sir. And what kind of the, the other first in the front, what kind of vehicle will he be in, sir? Uh, he's in a crew truck. Um, he's the one that called me, and he was doing some work out in the woods, and he stumbled upon a car that was burnt up, and he said it was burnt so bad, all he seen was the bones in the car. All right, sir, and uh, what kind, I'm sorry, you said what kind of service truck was he in, what kind of type of truck, sir? 
Uh, it's going to be a okay. flat bed on the back. Okay. All right. All right, sir. I'll get an officer heading that way as soon as possible. All right, thank you. Now, when the police arrive, they immediately smell vapors in the air, so they call arson investigators to the scene. The investigators examined the burned car and discovered two badly burned bodies in the trunk, one belonging to a child and the other belonging to an adult. According to news and record, the bodies were so badly damaged that identifying them visually was impossible. However, the police suspected that the bodies might be those of Asia and Ashton Brown, who were missing at that time. Their suspicions were reinforced when they located a burnt license plate near the car and upon running the plate through their DMV system, it came back belonging to Asia Brown. She had registered the car on the afternoon of February 20th. Despite all the evidence now pointing to the bodies belonging to Asia and Ashton Brown, the police couldn't be 100% certain until an autopsy was completed. The bodies were carefully transported to the medical examiner's office for testing, which would take months. And part of the reason that the testing would take so long was because the remains were so badly damaged that the medical examiner had to use DNA testing instead of bone x-rays or dental records. Now, since the car itself was a crime scene, it was left in the wooded area off of Thurston Avenue while investigators spent a week searching for other evidence. According to News & Record, at one point, it started to snow, so they had to cover the car with a tarp to protect it from the elements. Now, some of you may be looking at this and saying, well, why wouldn't they just tow it to their yard or tow it to a garage to better protect it? But you have to remember, the car itself, anytime you go into a crime scene, and I've said this before, Dr. Henry Lee told me this, anytime you enter a crime scene, regardless of how careful you are, you're contaminating that crime scene just by walking into it. So if you're in a position where the area around the car, which again is a crime scene itself, has not been disturbed, the last thing you want to do is tow it out of there and introduce all these outside elements that could affect the evidentiary value of what you find. You never want to give an opportunity for a, a defense attorney to say, hey, listen, yeah, they found this at the garage, but how do we know for sure that that piece of evidence didn't get there while transporting the vehicle? So there are some situations where we as investigators, we can't avoid moving the vehicle or moving the crime scene to a different location for whatever reason. But in this circumstance, it's, it's a road that's not heavily occupied. It's a dead end. As long as they have patrolmen out there to, to guard the scene and make sure that nobody enters it, it's the best place for it. Yes, it's cold out. Yes, it's going to get dark and you're going to have to work within the, the time frame of the day. But there's nothing better than being able to go out to the actual crime scene and investigate it while it's still undisturbed. So what you find in the car, what you find around it, it's all great evidence if it's found there as opposed to being found at a secondary location. Now, on February 24th, the day after Asia and Ashton were discovered in the burned car, the police held a news conference. They explained that they had 20 detectives working on this case alongside arson investigators, but they still didn't have any suspects yet. They urged anyone who was in the Thurston Avenue area on February 20th or February 21st and may have saw something suspicious to immediately call the police. After the news conference, Asia's friends told News & Record that they couldn't think of anyone who would want to hurt her or Ashton. One friend said, quote, it's just tearing me up. I don't know who could have done this, what would have been their intention, what would have been their motive. It just doesn't make sense. In early March, the police asked the public for information about Asia's whereabouts the week before she disappeared. They wanted to speak to anyone who saw or talked to her in the days leading up to her disappearance and murder. The police said they were trying to gather facts about Asia's life and they were searching for any evidence that could help them solve these heinous murders. Now, the police did say they believed they knew how the car fire was started, but they were still waiting for forensic confirmation. But as far as I can tell, they've never publicly confirmed whether an accelerant was used in the car fire or not. I will tell you this, based on what we know about statements and the smell of vapors, uh, more than likely there was an accelerant used, especially with how badly the vehicle was burned and the bodies were burned. They were dumped there and, and whoever put them there wanted to make sure that if and when they were found, uh, there would be very little evidentiary value. Now, in addition to that information, the police also said they wouldn't be sharing any details about Asia's car 
even its make and model because it was, quote, the entire crime scene and they wanted to, quote, keep a number of facts close to the vest. Now, I'm torn on this one. At this point, it's a relatively new case, so I'm fine with it. Obviously, details came out later. Again, when it initially happens, I understand it. Anything you have that the public is not aware of could be used as a form of guilt knowledge later. And we've talked about guilt knowledge a lot on Detective Perspective. They don't know what they're going to be faced with. They don't know what potential persons of interest or suspects they're going to be interviewing in the near future. They don't know what type of witnesses are going to come forward. And they don't know how much guilt knowledge they're really going to have to use at their disposal. So any little thing that they have, any little detail that can be used in an interrogation or an interview, you want to keep those cards in your back pocket just in case you need them. Now, as the case moves forward and you start to look for public assistance, you want to provide them with the basic details because you don't want everyone and their brother coming forward. You want to make sure that if they think they may have seen or heard something, it, it involves what you're actually looking for. So giving details like the make and model of a vehicle is probably not going to be a game changer for the case, but it could be critical for a witness who comes forward with information that may help you push the case forward. And speaking of pushing the case forward for the next month, investigators piece together a timeline of Asia's whereabouts leading up to the discovery of her vehicle. According to News & Record, the police found out that Asia bought the 2005 black Buick LaCrosse on February 20th. At around 1.30 p.m. that same day, she went to the High Point DMV office with Ashton to register the car in her name. The next sighting of Asia was around 3.20 p.m. when she arrived at the AutoZone store on Randleman Road to buy accessories for her new car. Now here's the interesting part. The police couldn't tell if Ashton was with Asia at that time because the store's video footage didn't show him. However, this was the final time that Asia was seen alive. Now, the police shared this information with the public and again asked anyone who had spoken or seen Asia on February 20th to come forward and help them fill in the gaps in her timeline. After all of this information was released, Asia's friend Brittany told News & Record that she struggles to imagine what happened to Asia and Ashton. She said, quote, I never dreamed something this bad would happen. I feel like it's very personal and someone knew her. I hope they get to the bottom of it. Now, like I said at the top of the show, typically I would add quotes from the victim's family throughout this episode, but in this case, Asia's mother and brother declined to speak with any media, and it could be because of how distraught they were over Asia and Ashton's deaths, which I completely understand, and, and maybe they just couldn't bring themselves to speak to the media. Uh, we don't know for sure. That's my guess, and as I said, completely understandable. Now, by the end of April, the police had obtained search warrants for Asia's Yahoo, iCloud, and Facebook accounts. This gave them more leads and additional people to talk to, which led them to learn more about Asia and Ashton. And by mid-May, DNA tests finally confirmed that the bodies found in the trunk belonged to Asia and Ashton Brown. The police had used DNA from Asia's parents to confirm her identity and DNA from Ashton's father to confirm his. The medical examiner still hadn't determined a cause of death, However, they knew the manner of death was without a doubt a homicide. At this time, the police provided an update to KENS5 stating the department was still following leads. They had spoken with Asia's friends, acquaintances, people she had relationships with, and Ashton's father. The lead detective said, quote, We have not run out of leads in this case. There's still a lot of avenues we're pursuing with this case. So it's nowhere close to being a cold case at this time. In late July, the police announced that Asia and Ashton's bodies were so badly burned that officials couldn't determine exactly how they died. The medical examiner wasn't sure if the two were still alive when the car was set on fire, but it was obvious that they were murdered, so their deaths were classified as, quote, homicidal violence of undetermined means. The police also mentioned that they needed tips. They wouldn't say if they had any persons of interest, only that they were still looking into many avenues, including the possibility that the murders were a random crime. Now, I will say this. I know they're looking into the possibility that it's a random crime, and they have to. That's their job. You have to explore all angles. But I will tell you that's the detective's worst fear. Because if there's no connection, if this person who is responsible for this just came out of the woodwork and happened to cross paths with the victims, 
just moments or hours before and there's and there's no direct connection or no indirect connection well the person can come into the picture do what they do leave and if there's no forensic evidence left behind how do you tie them to this if there's no digital data or no photographs or or any type of video surveillance footage how do you how do you connect this person to this case that's why 50% of the homicides in this country go unsolved i mean that's one of the reasons when it's a random act of violence like this and there's no connection it makes it very difficult to solve the case because ultimately what we're doing as detectives is we're looking at the evidence and reverse engineering the data, right? We're going to trace it back to try to connect it to the people involved. Well, if the person has no previous history with our victims, it makes that process very difficult. Now, in February 2016, it had been a year since the murders and the police were still searching for a motive and a suspect. The lead detective told the news and record that in his more than 10 years in investigating homicides, this was probably the most challenging case. It had been, quote, one challenge after another. Those challenges included a crime scene that was difficult to preserve because of the snow, causing it to take more than a week to process the scene. Then you had the conditions of the bodies, which required a detailed DNA analysis to confirm the identities. And to top all of it off, you have the emotional toll that the murder of a child can take on a detective. This isn't something we talk about a lot, but I can tell you firsthand, we are human beings. And we feel the same way you guys feel about cases like this. We're fathers, we're brothers, we're sisters, we're mothers. So when we come on a crime scene, any crime scene that involves a murder, it's difficult. It's hard for the brain to process. But when it's a child, especially if you have children yourself, yes, you have to remain objective and impartial, but you can't fake how you feel. Whatever emotion you have is, is going to be the emotion you have. You have to compartmentalize it. You have to keep it in check as much as you can. You can't let it cloud your judgment, but make no mistake about it. When you leave that scene and you're by yourself, uh, it affects you and, and it all comes out. I know I worked a case involving the molestation of a child and the way that we ultimately figured out who was responsible uh, was by going through all of the diapers from the daycare until we found a bloody diaper and which was dated and signed by the person responsible for changing that child's diaper. And, and through that process, we were able to identify the person, get them to confess and, and arrest them for the crimes they committed. But I remember that day and it was a hot summer day. It smelled really bad, as you can imagine, going through baby diapers. But when I found the diaper, or I should say when we found the diaper, uh, the emotion that came over me, I, I didn't even have children at the time, but also the emotion that came over the other detectives working that scene, some of them fathers, and, and I'll never forget that day. So it's definitely something that as a society, when we're looking at these cases, we, we consider all the factors, the, the environment, the time in which it occurred, the victims involved, the, the amount of suspects, but we don't really consider the emotional toll it has on the investigators and the impact it can have on the case. Now, despite all of these challenges, investigators were committed to pursuing every lead in every avenue possible. The lead detective said they were still trying to put together a timeline of Asia's last few days. They had learned that Asia and Ashton often visited friends, and in the week before their deaths, they didn't stay at their apartment. Now, the detective did not say where they were staying at the time of their disappearance or why they weren't staying at their apartment, Again, I think they're keeping that information internally in case someone eventually comes forward. The detective also went on to say that they closely examined Asia's text messages and social media accounts. And through this analysis, they learned that Asia posted on her social media on the morning of February 20th, but later that day, she stopped posting altogether, even though she was an active social media user. The lead detective said this was one reason why they now believed Asia and Ashton were killed on the 20th. The detective further told News & Record that they were still trying to figure out everything Asia did on the 20th. All they knew so far was that she and Ashton went to the DMV at 1.30 p.m. and then Asia went to the Auto Zone alone at 3.20 p.m. They weren't sure what she did between those times or where Ashton was when she went to Auto Zone. They wondered if she had dropped Ashton off so someone could watch him, and if she did, 
They wanted to speak to that person, but at that point, no one had come forward. The detective again asked people with information to contact the police so they could fill in Asia's timeline. In February of 2018, three years had passed, yet Asia and Ashton's murders remained unsolved. The police said they had pursued every lead and exhausted all forensic avenues. They didn't want to call it a cold case because they were still working on it, but they were getting to the point where they didn't have a lot of angles left to explore. Because of this, they went to the governor of North Carolina and asked him to put up a reward with the hopes that it would motivate someone to come forward with new information. The lead detective told Fox 8, quote, We just need the information so we can bring closure to this case, so we can bring justice to Asia and Ashton Brown. That month, the governor offered a $10,000 reward for information in Asia and Ashton's murders, but unfortunately, the police didn't receive any tips. And in February of 2022, that reward was increased to $15,000, but the police gave an update shortly after, stating they still hadn't received any new information. February 2024 marked nine years since Asia and Ashton Brown were murdered. Unfortunately, there haven't been any new updates in the case, and our family is still seeking justice. All right, let's dive into this perspective, and I want to go back and talk about the timeline as we know it and, and try to narrow it down. Again, it's speculative, but let's see what we can do. So we know that Asia was was seen on February 20th, both at the DMV and then at 3.20 p.m. at the Auto Zone. There is some debate out there whether or not Ashton was with her, but as I said in the, in the case, it's apparent that the police believe Ashton was not with Asia when she went to the auto zone, which would make sense. More than likely, she wouldn't leave him in the car at two years old by himself to go in and shop for accessories for her vehicle. So more than likely, she had dropped him off before that, uh, maybe between the DMV and, and the auto zone. And so we know we have that. And if, if Brittany's timeline is right, the last time she spoke to Asia was at 1.40 p.m. on that same day. And then you have the police telling us that they were able to access her social media accounts and she had posted earlier that day, but then didn't post again after that, even though she was an avid user. So I'm definitely with law enforcement uh, with the belief that whatever happened to Asia happened shortly after AutoZone, whether she went home or went to the friend's house or went to an acquaintance's house, whatever happened she had picked up Ashton at that point, and wherever she went, the incident occurred shortly after that. I do not believe she was alive on February 21st, and the reason uh, I do not believe that she was alive on the 21st is because if there was any indication whatsoever that someone had had contact with her or there was some type of activity uh, on one form of her digital data, then law enforcement would, would tell us that. They wouldn't narrow the window and come out publicly and say that they believe that Ashton and Asia were killed on the 20th. There's something telling them that whatever happened to Asia after it occurred, her phone activity shut down completely. So that's kind of where they're pinpointing it. And to not have anyone come forward to at least say, oh, I saw her or her vehicle on the 21st. I think that's where they're coming up with this window. And I'm in line with that. So that brings us to, okay, what happened between 3.20 p.m. and sometime that evening or early the next morning? The, the jury's out on that one. I don't have all the factors on it, but we can play out a couple scenarios. As law enforcement has come out and said, she was not staying at her apartment at the time when she and Ashton were murdered. What does that tell us? Well, they haven't said who the friend is or where she was staying, I'm going to imagine with 20 detectives working this case that that individual was thoroughly vetted. Does that mean that they're clear of any potential suspicion? Not at all. If anything, if law enforcement thought that they were somehow involved or knew more than they were saying, they probably would not come out and say that publicly, you know, not trying to create a potential where it would spook this individual and they would take off and flee the state or flee the country. So there may be something that we don't know where detectives have a potential person of interest, um, but are not going to say that publicly for the sake of jeopardizing the case. Yes, it's nine years old, but 
in the relative terms of cold cases, it's not that old yet. So I think that the person she was staying with is going to be high on the list of persons of interest. I also mentioned that there's obviously contact with Ashton's father. I don't know what where he stands on this investigation as far as what type of relationship he had with Asia and were they on good terms? Was was Ashton seeing the father consistently throughout the relationship? Could could Ashton have been with him during the time while she was at AutoZone? I don't know if that was a possibility. And then they also have to vet friends, families, acquaintances, uh, individuals that Asia may have been speaking to romantically. Uh, there's a lot of people that they have to talk to. And when you have a window from 3.20 p.m. to sometime potentially the next morning on the 21st, that's a large window where you have a lot of people in her circle who could be involved. But then you also have, as we mentioned earlier, the random act of violence. Did someone see her at the DMV? Did someone see her at the auto zone? Did someone see her while she was stopped at a traffic light? All these scenarios are in play. The only problem with that is if it happened while she was out on the road and she had Ashton in the vehicle, you ask yourself, how would this person gain entry to her vehicle? Let's go down that road. Could it have been someone who was posing as a position of authority, like a police officer or a firefighter, where she lowered her guard and they were able to gain access to her, her vehicle and then overpower her, taking her somewhere before killing her in Ashton? Possible. Then the motive in that situation would be just some sadistic individual who got gratification from killing these two individuals. Is it possible? Sure. I don't think it's likely. As some others have mentioned, friends and family of hers, this feels personal to me. We talked about the murder of a child throughout this episode. Ashton would not have been a witness in this case. He would not have implicated his offender. He's too young to do that, two years old. So this person killed Ashton for a reason. They wanted to send a message. I leave this episode asking myself, if that's the case, what's the message? Did this person have an ax to grind with Asia? Or did this person have a problem with someone Asia was associated with? And that's where the real investigative work takes place. You have to build out this dynamic of Asia's associates, close and far, regardless of how close they actually were, it's about perception. If there's someone out there who had a problem with Asia or one of Asia's friends or Ashton's father, they might not be directly connected to Asia, and yet they know who Asia is. That creates a blind spot for investigators. And so if they haven't looked at that angle yet, which again, I'm under the assumption they have, that is something that needs to be explored thoroughly. Because what's the message? If Asia's dead, what are you telling her by killing her son? She's already gone. Was that message intended for someone who's still alive? And if so, who? Now, real quickly, let's talk about the geography of this, of this area because I obviously was not familiar with it. I've done two cases in North Carolina, but nothing in Greensboro. I did a quick search. I know she wasn't staying at the, uh, from what I understand, the last place she was living at was on Orchard Street, but I did a quick search from Orchard Street to the Thurston Avenue area where her vehicle and her and the bodies were found, and it's about six minutes away, 2.8 miles. I also did a search from Orchard Street to the Auto Zone, which was five minutes away, 3.1 miles. And what's interesting about it, and maybe we can throw a map up right here, the, the distance between the Orchard Street address and the auto zone, it's a little bit longer, and the Thurston Avenue area would actually be in between those two locations. So if something happened in between there, it could have been on her way home, or she could have got to the Orchard Street apartment for something, maybe picking something up. Maybe somebody was staying there with Ashton for a couple hours, even though she wasn't sleeping over at that location, and then maybe whatever occurred there they ended up at the Thurston Avenue crime scene after whatever incident took place. And while we're talking about the Thurston Avenue crime scene, I do want to mention that I do not believe Asia and Ashton were killed there. 
Whatever happened to them happened at a secondary location. Was it Orchard Street or a different location? I have no insight into that, but more than likely, they were murdered at a different part of town and then placed in the trunk and transported to the crime scene we're aware of by their offender or offenders. And obviously, the vehicle was burned to try to eliminate any potential trace evidence that could link back to the offender and also make the investigator's job that much harder. Now, as tragic as that is, it does open up some potential avenues to explore that may have not been explored before. We know law enforcement has came out multiple times and said, hey, if you saw Asia on the 20th or 21st, come forward. Maybe we should put something out there saying, hey, if you saw any individuals operating a 2005 black Buick LaCrosse on that day, come forward. We want to hear from you. Maybe they were operating that vehicle in that area and they were seen by someone while they were traveling to the crime scene. We don't know. We haven't really asked for that. And everyone might be so focused and have tunnel vision on, hey, did you see Asia? Maybe they didn't see Asia because she was in the trunk of the vehicle. However, maybe they saw someone else driving a vehicle similar to Asia's. Couldn't end up being nothing, but I think it's definitely worth exploring. And that's where you guys come in. You can help solve this case if you're from that area and you have information. And just to give everybody a recap, Asia Brown was last seen at around 3.20 p.m. on February 20th, 2015 at the AutoZone store on Randleman Road in Greensboro, North Carolina. Three days later, her recently purchased 2005 Black Buick LaCrosse was found burned in a wooded area off Thurston Avenue, a service road near the bank, of South Buffalo Creek. Asia and her two-year-old son, Ashton, were discovered in the trunk. If you have any information about this case, please contact Crime Stoppers at 336-373-1000. There is still a $15,000 reward available. And lastly, I want to send my thoughts out to Asia and Ashton's family and friends. As I said before, many of them have not spoken publicly, and I completely understand why. In the cases where we do have family members come forward and they're vocal, I always say I'm so surprised and and inspired by the courage they have to do so because I don't know if I would be able to do that as well. So we're thinking of them, whether they see this episode or not, uh, we're going to keep pushing forward and hopefully they get the call that they've been waiting for for nine years and that's that they know who did this and they're going to be finally held responsible for what they did to Asia and Ashton Brown. That's going to do it for me tonight, guys. Everyone stay safe out there, and I'll see you next week.